Yeah, I decided that the last episode wasn't quite worth a cinematic recap. Hello, and welcome back to The Last Project, our Kerbal Space Program series in which we will attempt to colonize every single body in the, in the Kerbal Solar System. And by bodies, I mean celestial bodies, I forgot to say in that word. This is episode... four. Yes, probably. Episode four, the... Successor to episode 3, in which we put together a ship. We have built ourselves, out of various different parts collected in orbit around Gerbin, a little interplanetary shuttle, comprising two hulls, two main sections, which are pretty much mirrors of each other, uh, with the exception of one out-of-place Val unique module, a solar collector. And yes, it is today, it is today that we will be going to Val. The ship is supposed to be equipped in order to actually fulfill our mission objective for three bodies around Jewel, which is the gas giant that we are heading towards right now. It's supposed to be able to colonize Bop, uh, Paul, and Val. And we're gonna go for Val first, that will take out the that will take the duration of this video. So here we are. We have done our transfer burn out at the end of the last episode, and we have now arrived in the dual solar system. No, not the dual solar system. The dual planetary system. Is that, is that right? The dual? Just the dual system, I think, actually. Funnily enough, the dual system was going to be a title for... This series? No. Space Tourism was going to be called the dual system. Yeah, that was it. Anyway, so we'll be doing lots of orbital ballet before we actually end up getting to dual... Uh, getting to Val. But before that happens, we have some, uh, some in-atmosphere ballet to do. Otherwise known as burning up horribly. So in the last episode, not none last episode, in episode 2, in the EVE mission, I made three major mistakes. In this one I do make some mistakes, but they aren't quite as major, and they are somewhat more forgivable. One of the mistakes I don't make, I don't make in today's episode, is one that I made in the EVE episode, which is not trusting my error-breaking calculator. Now, error breaking around Eve was a bit, ooh, a bit risky. Error breaking around Jewel is catastrophic if you get it wrong. Because in this series we are not quick loading or quick saving, so if I fail. I failed for good, I will lose all of these. So, I've got to make sure I get this just right, and I've placed my trust in the orbital. Uh, in the orbital error breaking calculator. If you just search error breaking calculator KSP in Google, it'll be the top result if you want to use it for yourself. It, you put in several different numbers and it predicts the uh, the orbital periapsis you should have for the orb body that you are currently orbiting, or at least in a escape trajectory. I can't talk today. In a trajectory around, you know that kind of thing where periapsis on planets and the atmosphere and stuff. And so it tells you how deep into the atmosphere you should go, and as a result, how much how much a delta v you will lose in order to get you to the orbit you want. And so we have done just that, and we are now plunging our way into this thick green atmosphere. And that is not a euphemism. And everything's going... Well, you can't really tell, can you? You can't really tell right now. Everything's on fire! <laughs> so to an outside observer, everything is going rather badly. But of course, to us KSP veterans, we know that being on fire is not cause for harm. Unless you have something like deadly... deadly re-entry, is that what it's called? Mod installed? To us, veterans of the vanilla KSP variety, the vanilla tasting ice cream that is known as Kerbal Space Program, a little fire does no damage whatsoever. In fact, a little fire makes for a rather nice thumbnail, but I don't know whether I'll use that as a thumbnail, so... Oh well. And after a few more minutes of that, which literally was minutes, it lasted a very long time doing that little error-breaking, decelerating maneuver, we have actually arrived at an orbit, at an elliptical orbit, with an apoapsis of around 40 million meters, which is, it just so happens, the orbital altitude of Val. I trusted the error breaking calculator, and I was right to do, to, 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 to do so. So in the future, if I ever get any error breaking wrong, I will blame the error breaking calculator. Anyway, at least now we've slowed down into the dual planetary system, whatever one's call it, thing. And we can time warp to our inclination node, which is the point at which we would cross over the equatorial orbit of Val. At least I think it's equatorial. Ours certainly wasn't, so at any rate we had an inclination difference, and then we cancelled it. 
so that we have a better chance of actually encountering Val at some point in this video. Which we will set up the burn to do right about now. Now what we might want to do is just wait, you know, stay in our current orbit and wait to get an encounter. I would prefer to take matters into my own hands though, so at the periapsis, or at the apoapsis even, I'm going to be burning prograde, as we are doing right now, and raising my periapsis out from within Jules' atmosphere into interplanetary space, somewhere between Jules' atmosphere and Lave's orbit, I believe, Lave being the innermost planet, or the innermost moon, not a planet. Lave is perhaps the moon that you most would most often mistake for a planet, because it's got an atmosphere, and it's got oceans, and it's really, really nice. Uh, but we're not going there today, no, we're going to Val. So we raise our periapsis to about a lave's orbit, which will actually delay our orbital period sufficiently, so that when we next come round to roughly this point in space, we get an encounter with Val. Which is pretty good. First third of the mission complete. Now we time warp down to that periapsis, completely missing lathe, because that, well, we really don't want to go there, as has already been established. And now we just need to make sure that we actually decelerate into orbit around Val. And you may think that doing that maneuver then might have actually lost us some fuel, might have been less efficient. In reality it wasn't. It might have lost us a little bit. But in reality it helped us in two ways. By increasing the size of our orbit, you know, increasing the average altitude of it, we actually decreased our relative velocity to Val, which means that now slowing down into an orbit around Val takes less delta V. Because our relative velocity is lower, so rendezvousing with it takes less delta V. It's been a while since I've actually... It's not been a while, it's, it's only recently that I've started considering uh, orbital bodies as really any other type of rendezvousing target. Sure, they affect you with their gravity, but really you can just consider them to be, you know, a target for rendezvous, and if you use that kind of... If you use the same logic that you would use when you're rendezvousing with a ship, you can... It offers new insights into what is and what isn't efficient. So there was a bit of a ramble. Anyway, we successfully decelerate, and we... Su I say decelerate loads today. I've... It's keep on... Whenever I say it, I keep on thinking, wow, well, that's weird. Because I'm not the type of person who says decelerate. I, 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 it's just not my usual vocabulary for some reason. Anyway, moving br briskly on. So we have dropped down into the orbit of Val. And the first things first, we want to separate out our interplanetary ship here into our two different holes, our two separate holes. One for Val, and one to continue on out back into the dual system and go and deliver modules and kerbals to the other two moons that we will be occupying with this mission. I do this a bit in a weird way. I, I separate out the two, which is, yes, the first step we want to take, and then I'm thinking, okay, we have six habitation modules here, three on either side, and we want to have two per moon. So, I'm going to take the engine off of one, take the engine off of the other one, bring this engine up and dock it onto the back of the first hull, and then using that I can then transfer the habitation module back down to where this, origin, uh, this engine originally came from. Which makes sense if the engines were unique in some way, you know, as if I had to use one engine for one specific hull. That's not the case, these engines are actually entirely the same, so I wasted a bit of time by detaching both of them individually, when I could have just detached the one that was already on the initial hull alongside and keep it attached to a habitation module in this way, and then I could have detached and basically swapped the engines over. But anyway, it doesn't really matter, the end result is the same. We have our habitation module docked onto our engine, is going to reattach onto the second hull, and this one, now with four habitation modules, is going to be the mission that will continue out into the planetary system to go populate... I say populate, we're really not, are we? <laughs> to go land a few Kerbals on Bop and on Pol. Maybe not in that order, we'll see how the orbits work out. Yes, Laurie, thank you. And now it is time to actually redock our engine. And after we do so, there is one last thing that needs to be removed from this assembly here. We have ended up using a lot of fuel. If you look down to the bottom left, we've used a lot of fuel. And although this is just the fuel from our tank at the back there, 
Actually, the tank at the front, the one in between our unique module and our current habitation modules, is empty. We really, really do not have much fuel, and we definitely want to do. We definitely want, don't want to waste what we have left by lugging around an empty tank. So we're going to try and get rid of this thing, which proves to be a little more complicated than I thought it would be, because we are basically splitting the ship in half, and then we're trying to redock the rest of the ship back onto our other half. Unfortunately, that other half, being the unique module, doesn't have any RCS, no reaction control systems. So we're going to have to knock this out the way just by using the brunt force of collision. Rocket science! Just just knocking things out of the way. And then, yes, we can redock, and it's pretty much simple from there. And then, now that we have significantly lowered the mass and lowered the operating status of our ship here, we are ready to deorbit even closer to Val to actually lower our apoapsis now. And that's what we will do for this ship. Of course, the other ship has no need to bring itself down into Val's gravity well, because that would be a waste of fuel. It's only going to climb back up and escape again, so we might as well leave it in the orbit that we have currently. In fact, I probably should have saved even more fuel by leaving this in orbit around Joule, rather than bringing it into Val's orbit. Probably would have made sense in the long run. And in fact, the other one didn't have much fuel, and this one hasn't really got much fuel either. I'm just going to have to hope, hope and pray, that we have sufficient fuel to actually complete our two next missions. If we don't, we might have to ship more fuel out, perhaps with the next Jewel mission that we do. Because of course we will have to come back for Jewel in, uh, come back to Jewel in order to colonize Tylo and Lathe. Not in that order. Depending. We'll probably... Yeah, we might leave. We might leave Lave till last. Actually, I don't know. It depends. We might leave the Moon and Minmus till last. I got a few comments on the last video asking. Last is a word I say a lot. I got a few comments on episode three. People were asking, "Do Moon, do the Moon and Minmus around Kerbin count as celestial bodies?" And yes, yes, they do. So we're going to be count. We're going to be colonizing every single body in the Kerbal Soul System, apart from Kerbin. And that does include the Moon and Minmus. When we will do that, and using what will we do that, I'm not entirely sure. I don't think we need a transfer engine. We could probably just take one habitation module and then, you know, one of these self-powered habitation modules. And get it to do it for us. Anyway, that's enough blabber. Now that we have successfully brought our peripsis, our apoapsis down, we are now in orbit at a fairly low altitude, around 40 kilometers around Val, and we can take out one of our habitation modules, one of our two habitation modules. Redock this just to keep it in orbit all in one piece, and then we'll be taking the habitation module down onto the surface. I was tempted originally, I was almost certainly going to go to Valhenge, the anomaly that's on the south pole of Val. Two reasons why I didn't. One, it really wouldn't have been efficient, and we really don't have that much fuel. Because we're in an equatorial orbit right now, I don't want to have to translate all the way down to the South Pole. It'll take literally more fuel than we have, I think. Secondly, I don't know where it is. I mean, I know it's at the South Pole, but I don't quite know exactly where it is. I don't have coordinates for it or anything, and if I did have the coordinates, which are available online, I'm sure, uh, I don't think Vanilla KSP has a coordinate system, so I'd have to guess where that is anyway. It does have a coordinate system, um, no, excuse me, it does, but that only shows for ships that are already landed, and Valhenge does not count as a ship, so that's why. Those are the two reasons why we didn't go there. Instead, we are just landing on the equator, which is pretty much fine, right? Landing on the equator is good enough, uh, provided that we can actually land, of course. So beginning to burn in order to slow ourselves down, 12.2 kilometers up, roughly, and we can slow ourselves down. And landing on this is pretty easy. In fact, I went down uh, with the habitation module that had the most fuel, just in order to scout out how much fuel it would use up. Because the other, ha the other habitation module that we are using, and the other one we will be landing, hopefully, uh, doesn't have quite as much fuel in it. At some point during the mission, we used it up in order to... Well, I've got no idea, we just used it. We used it in some situation. So this is the one with the most, and as you can see, even with the extra fuel, it didn't come anywhere near 
to uh, to using much more than about two thirds. I'd say we've used probably about two thirds, which means the other one should have plenty of fuel to land as well. So let's bring this one down, very very gently. And don't die, don't die. Who knows what could happen? It could land. Oh, it's entirely safe. Fantastic. Now, I'm not going to bother getting out any Kerbals because we're in too much of a rush to try and get this video finished. So, instead, we will just say yes, that has been landed, fantastic, and we will proceed with the next one. Now, I've been talking about the Habitation module, but of course we have another module to land, and that is the Unique module. The Solar Collector. The thing that will bring us all the energy we could possibly need. Comprising some engines and a tank of fuel, which I think is entirely full. Yes, I think the fuel from the habit it is that I think the fuel from the habitation module, uh, the, you know, the one that is slightly empty, the one that's still in orbit right now, actually went into refilling this. And of course, yes, this is the energy module. This is the solar array with eight, eight massive solar panels. We are hoping to bring enough power, just a little, a little flavor piece for our land landing base. And I actually was going to have those solar panels open. Uh, and, you know, make sure that we had enough energy. But as the engines are mounted radially all around the fuel tank, and it seemed like the fuel, the plasma, coming from one of those engines, or four of those engines actually, was hitting the solar panel, I refrained. I said I'd close them. Not realizing the terrible fate that that decision would cause. So we have these engines. These engines, I might add, that don't generate electricity. And the four outermost solar arrays, which are entirely out of the way, you know, they would not be hit by the thrust of those engines. It's only the inner ones that would, and it's only the inner ones that I thought to try open and then closed. It turns out that this craft, besides the wealth of solar panels it have, it has, does not have any sort of of energy generation. The engines don't generate energy. There's no radiothermal generators. All the solar panels are currently closed. And there's no batteries. It's... Uh, and there's no kerbals. It's just a probe core. And as of now, it is just a very dead probe core. I've got no energy to turn the ship. I haven't even got energy to turn on the engines anymore. I cut the throttle and then bam, now it's gone. So, goodbye our unique module. Unfortunately, we didn't succeed in landing you. Uh, luckily, no, you don't have any Gerbils, so that has not contributed to our death safety rating at all. <laughs> our death rating. Death rating. So, as a result, we can just carry on. And we can hopefully call it, you know, call it just a fluke. That was the bad luck for this mission. Because, you know, every mission has to have some quantity of bad luck. So now that we've got that over and done with, we can carry on and hopefully everything else will go fine. But damn, that was the mistake, wasn't it? That was a massive mistake. Not having any sort of backup energy ge generation on the solar panel, and being too dim-witted to realise that not having solar panels open would actually uh, lead to a lack of energy. Damn, damn, damn. Oh well, as long as the Kerbals survive, everything is fine. As long as the Kerbals survive. Don't worry, we, we, we will land fine. I can guarantee you we will land absolutely fine. Don't worry about it. So here we come down. The final, uh, the final part of today's video. The final mission thing. And we are just going to try and land within 100 meters of our target craft. In fact, I'd actually like to be a bit closer than 100 meters. I'd like to land more, you know, closer to 50 meters away. Just so we're pretty close and it can be a nice thumbnail. It's for the thumbnail! It's for the thumbnail, damn it! So, we can do exactly what we did with the other video, of the, with the other mission, with the other habitation module, and bring our ship down. And as that happens in the background, I can talk about something else for a few seconds. Uh, I have been developing VR stuff. I've been talking about the Oculus Rift and VR for quite a while now, and the Leap Motion, which is what I was using to track my hands in that one VR hand tracking video I uploaded. Now I've been developing for myself, now that the Oculus SDK supports Unity Free. So I've actually been doing some cool hand tracking stuff, and I think either yesterday 
or maybe tomorrow from when you watch this video, if it's uploaded on Friday, which it should be. Uh, I ought to be posting a video of some of that developing stuff that I've done, so if you're interested in that, you might want to go watch it, because hopefully it'll be quite quite exciting. It certainly is for me. I've never really done any major coding or develop development before, so it's quite nice to actually find something that motivates me to do it. But anyway, returning back to our original video. Here we are, landed, and about 90 meters away within the 100 mark. But, you know, I'd like to be close to the 100 meters, as I said, I'd like to be 50 meters. So though we have landed safely, I might just take off again and pogo over to our ship. I mean, what could possibly go wrong? Should we just rewind that? I start the engines right about now. I start throttling up and start pushing the th the pitch forwards for some reason and then fall over. <laughs> Death count. Um, we lost eight on Eve, four on Val. Death count 88 Kerbals. 88 Kerbals remaining. We've lost. 12% of the surviving crew members. <sighs> we landed fine! It's just the pogoing attempt that failed. <sighs> I think we're going to run out of kerbals. Oh well. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you very much for watching The Last Project, Episode 4. In the next episode, we will be continuing around Jewel. There's not going to be any docking around Kerbin, we're going straight to another gameplay episode. So, again, thank you for watching. If you liked the video, please do like the video, and I will see you all next time. And I promise I won't kill anyone. Probably. <laughs>